You're listening to Digital Now, an original business and technology podcast by Logic 2020. I'm your host, Matt Treville. Each episode, I'll be interviewing a new expert to learn more about industry trends, fascinating new tech, shifting customer expectations, and the steps every business can take to stay ahead. Welcome, everyone, to the Digital Now podcast from Logic 2020. Uh, those of you who are frequent listeners may realize there's a slightly different accent on this uh, podcast version today. Uh, Matt Truvell uh, will be stepping out for this episode, and, and I will be conducting uh, this interview. Uh, my name is, is Mick Wagner, and I am a senior solutions architect in the advanced analytics practice at Logic. And today, we will be talking to Ilya Sapin, who is a director and leads our architecture practice. Um, he has a lot of experience in, in designing um, complicated solutions provide, and providing architecture expertise um, to deliver cutting-edge solutions to help um, businesses uh, achieve uh, um, digital transformation. You want to tell us a little bit about yourself, Ilya, before we uh, we jump into this uh, topic of domain-driven design? Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Mick. Uh, Ilya Tsapin uh, worked for Logic 2020 for the past six years. Very happy. Uh, it's a great company to be at. Um, my role right now comprises a lot of components, and one of them is linear architecture practice. and to do that, you have to be a hands-on practitioner. So I work on a number of projects where I do provide architecture advisory to our teams and specifically directly to our clients as well. That gives me enough opportunity to obtain new knowledge and uh, see how this knowledge could be applied in practice, which I think really valuable uh, for consultants. Yeah, I'm excited. Let's let's dig in. So what is domain-driven design and what makes this approach different from what people are currently doing? Well, and yeah, it's pretty loaded question, I would say. If I would be formal, like on definition, domain-driven design is a software design approach focusing on modeling software to match domain according to input from the domain experts. That's kind of a definition of the term. Uh, what it really means, at least to me personally, it is a methodology, a framework, you put the right word in it, uh, to establish the right vocabulary and the right approach during your sessions when you as IT leader is coming to a meeting with a bunch of experts and talking to them about their specific business goals, their specific uh, domain area. Before I joined IT, I used to work in management consulting. And uh, there I worked for manufacturing, for banking, lots of different industries, lots of different clients. And each time you go there, you need to work and understand the business model how the business is operating, what they're doing. Um, and of course, everybody will be telling you that their process is absolutely unique. And um, you need to go very deep to understand how it all works, which is to some degree true, to some degree it is an exaggeration. Uh, it's somewhere in the middle. But what really fascinated me all the time is that you need to get into this mode of capturing the right keywords, understanding what exactly the client means, connecting the dots between vocabularies of different clients. That will be, that we'll talk about it when we start talking about like bounded context and so forth. And understanding this common ground to which everybody could uh, agree. And so when uh, the main driven design came into game, it is very much along the lines of this idea of making sure that we have the model everybody can understand, use, 
and uh, that's why I like it so much. <laughs> No, that's that's wonderful. It sounds like it's really putting the focus less on the technology and, and more on making sure people can can use it, and it's it's really meeting their needs. It's um it's kind of funny in the in the data world, we've got something kind of similar with um, domain data modeling um, mm -hmm. and using a data mesh technique. So it sounds like this is kind of connecting those dots on a applications level, which is which is pretty exciting. Wouldn't agree more. Even more to that. The main recommendation there, you need to build your services, you need to build your entities, not describing what is happening under the hood. So you need to provide the insight what it is doing and what should be the outcome of uh, the processing information or call in that particular entity. But by any means, you try to avoid to say how that will be done. Reason being, First, uh, one side of the uh, conversation not necessarily need to know that. And second, the way how it is done could uh, change from time to time, right? It's an evolution. So encapsulating that inside of your entity and exposing only uh, the information that is needed, and that information should use this common vocabulary, that's really important piece. And in this um, brain-driven design methodology, it's a core ambiguous language, if I pronounce it correct. Uh, and it basically describes a necessity to establish the language that is um, clearly understood by all parties. Sure. Because sometimes they might use different uh, same words with a different meaning, and there you go. <laughs> No, that makes that makes a lot of sense. I feel like uh, from the data side, I've had so many conversations with people arguing over, you know, definitions of, of terms and whatnot. So, so seeing it applied to this process, um, it makes a ton of sense. So, how would um, this domain-driven design? How, how does this actually help the business though? Like, if I'm a business user, what are the benefits that I'm, that I'm expecting to see if I'm getting my team to to take this approach? Oh, to answer this question. Just a little bit of example of kind of my personal experience. I joined IT domain at some point again, probably six years ago, after a huge break when I was doing management consultant as a, uh, consulting as I managed. So when I rejoined back to the domain, I had a bit of a different mindset, and I saw the person that was creating the huge piece of code that encapsulated the business logic, what it has to do, right? And I was looking at it, it was literally more than a thousand line of code. Oh, wow. And I was like, hey, there is no way the business can actually, will ever look at it, would ever comprehend this, mm -hmm. and would ever say that this is right or wrong. Uh, so there is no way business will be reviewing your source code, right? I think mm -hmm. we can agree on that. What could be happening on contrary to that? The business and the IT can work together on this model they established. Using this vocabulary, they established as well. And going through this model, going through these diagrams and everything, making sure they understand exactly how it works. And sometimes they can go pretty deep, sometimes they can stay high level. But when the business gets their sign off on this model, it means two things. First, the business logic that depicted there is correct. And second, IT team is ready to go to implement it. Um, assuming they do it by this model, it will it should work out fine. If you don't kind of try to invent something on the top of that on your own, right? Uh, and then business doesn't don't need to go back and check that it actually works uh, because that model should be depicted in the code. Yes, there is a testing component and everything, but in theory it should match and then everybody is happy. So it makes business life, businesses life easier uh, to vet that IT actually understood the use case. And it's easier for IT to structure their code and build entities they need in their code as well. Uh, so it's, it's matching how business thinks. 
I can give you one specific example, which I like very much. Assume consultant, consultant is coming uh, to a meeting with a client and they start talking about um, cargo shipping application. So the business is, starts to talk about, well, there are stops, there are legs, there is a teen area. This is the way how we process our cargo from point A to point B, all that stuff. The IT consulting consultant comes back with a model which depicts, okay, this is the cargo, this is its ID, this is stop A, this is stop B, stop C, and so forth. Huge gaps. Mm -hmm. We talked about it in area, but we don't have that in the model the IT consultant has built. So it's the the reason why we talked about it here because it's important because it's a entity that gives a business understanding of what's actually going on. For example, if I want to make sure that there is no gaps, for example, uh, I've, I shipped my cargo from A to B and then from B to C, just by saying that I understand there is no discrepancy there. A, B, B, C is a kind of smooth uh, transition of the cargo. But if on my itinerary I see that the cargo goes from A to B and then from C to D, I'm like wondering how, what was the magic? It actually went from B to C. What is that? In the model, which was oversimplified and provided by the IT consultant, this particular piece has been completely missed. And yes, you can force it on like on a database layer and uh, make sure that we account to that in certain constraints. But mm -hmm. when you introduce itinerary as an object, as an entity, it becomes easier and it becomes much uh, easier for the business to understand uh, what's actually happening. No, that's great. Um, that's a really amazing um, kind of approach and, and mindset. Um, one of the things that, that I took away from that description was that you're really building that trust between the IT and the business. And, and once you get that trust, you're going to see, you know, adoption skyrocket. You're going to be bridging that gap um, between the, the, the business and IT team and, and really kind of getting that, um, that extra ROI out of those uh, technology um, investments. So that's, that's great. Absolutely. And... Um... Also, it build, establish new relationship between different sides of businesses as well, right? Because then IT becomes that liaison that allows them to talk. And also the IT is forces, helps you to force the processes you were not able to enforce before. And wow. one team was struggling, asking another to do something. There is no way to do that until at some point the IT came in and it was solidified in the software in a way both teams actually agreed upon and then it's a charter for them to work together, right? And then talking about the bounded context, uh, we might have multiple models that live together within your uh, design of your model, your overall model, right? Uh, you have your finance group, you have your engineering group, you have your uh, group that actually manages the actual work and so forth. Bounded context is the way for them to have the uniqueness while being a part of the larger picture. And that's also really important uh, to keep in mind because then you avoid the situation of, okay, this is the perfect uh, definition for everyone. This is the only way we should be doing this. Everybody should comply to that. It will not work in reality. We all know that. And um, also important thing to uh, call out here. We always try to boil the ocean and we see a lot of companies which go through the exercise such as let's create this model and they want to make it as detailed as possible. Please don't. <laughs> you need to build it on the level of details. The business and IT can understand each other and work together. 
We are not building a Wikipedia or something. Uh, it's the common language is the primary target here. The common entities, the important entities, the important constraints are the primary goal here. There is no need to get and outline every single uh, rule right away in this model just for the sake of outlining everything. It's an evolution and the rules that are needed will make their way in. It's important part to remember as well. No, that's that's brilliant. That's that's actually a really good thing to call out. And then you were really kind of, like you mentioned earlier, developing those relationships and allowing that team some autonomy and really being able to kind of achieve their maximum. Um, I'm sure that creates a really good working environment and that people are, are thrilled to, to be in that sort of environment. So my, you know, my team, I don't think they're currently doing that. Um, what are the cases um, where it would make sense to start applying this? Like if I wanted to run a pilot, how would I kind of identify the right area to start doing this? Or do I need to kind of make huge changes across the entire org? How, how do I get started? I think from my personal perspective, the waiting starts by realization the complexity of the business rules and complexity of the organization. If you're building a very simple use case and it's pretty obvious what your use case is and how it will be handled, there is no need to go into domain driven design. It will be a wasted time for a nicely sounded label. Uh, but when you have multiple stakeholders, multiple, for example, on one of my clients right now, we have one team that's in charge of building bomb of materials, bill of materials. There is a second team that holds information about the entities we're actually building in the context of a schedule and how that has to be built. We have a data warehouse. There's a third uh, player in this conversation and we have the CRM system that is the fourth and uh, probably I'm not mentioning three or four different systems on the top of that like nomenclature uh, repository that also are the part of this overall complicated process with one simple goal actually to build some infrastructure on the ground. Uh, that's a pretty complicated uh, and convoluted process. There is a lot of workflows there, approval workflows, which has to have pretty accurate definitions. And if you don't have a domain driven design approach embedded, you will see that a lot of times, and most of the times actually, the conversation will be along the lines, this didn't go through, this is not in the right status, or, I don't understand why the status of this entity is this. Can you please explain me why the flag has been flipped from like draft to denied or from approved to draft and so forth? Because people mm, do not have this uh, domain driven design in place. It's hard for them uh, to build a system that will be working accordingly, it will be easier to project and give this information right away what's needed. Going back to my itinerary example, that is one of the things we are working closely with this client and making sure that we are simplifying, make it easier, and mm -hmm. everybody is talking on the same language. No, that's really great. I imagine you're also reducing the amount of, of rework or multiple iterations um, pretty significantly by getting everyone kind of on that same page from, from day one. Um, that's, that's wonderful. Um, well, th that's, uh, I think we're going to call this a, a wrap. Um, thank you, Ilya, for, for walking us through uh, the domain-driven design approach. Um, this is really fascinating stuff. I, I can clearly see why you're excited about it and how it drives a lot of uh, business value for for our clients. Um, I'm really excited to see how I can start thinking about these approaches and, and working them in with um, with my client project teams. Um, but with that, if any of you would like to learn more about how this approach could could help your company, um, please reach out to uh, to Logic 2020, and you can email Ilya directly at iliat at logic2020.com. That can be found in the uh, the footnotes of the uh, of the podcast. 
with that, everyone, we, we wish you a good day. Thank you for having me. You've been listening to Logic 2020's podcast, Digital Now. To learn more, visit our website at logic2020.com or follow us on social media. See you next time.